So hello everyone and welcome to this another a day with me session where I'll be taking you through some of my interesting cases of the day and uh, we'll be sharing some useful insights with you. So starting with my first case, so here I have a 15 year old boy who came with spastic paraplegia and this is the MRI spine done for this patient. So these are the T2 weighted sagittal images of the cervical spine of this patient where we can see the tip of the odontoid is actually above the foramen magnum and is compressing the cord causing narrowing, severe narrowing and signal change in the cord. There is no tonsillar herniation as such that is seen. There was some degree of platybasia as well. So this is the report that I had given that this condition is called basilar invagination where the tip of the odontoid is above the level of foramen magnum which was causing significant narrowing of the canal and compression of the cord at that level. There was abnormal flattening of the skull base with the angle of more than 143 degrees. I'll come to how to calculate that angle later on in the video. There was no significant obstruction. Uh, hence, no hydrocephalus or syrinx formation was seen within the cord. And there was no tonsillar herniation. Hence, ruling out Chiari malformation. So basilar invagination comes under the broad category of craniovertebral junction anomalies. So what exactly is craniovertebral junction? Craniovertebral junction is formed by the occipital condyles, the atlas that is C1 vertebra and the axis C2 vertebra and their articulations. So any process which can give rise to malformations of these structures will result in CVJ anomaly. It can be due to congenital, developmental or acquired cause. So to understand any CV junction anomaly, we first need to understand the CV junction anatomy, which is a bit complex considering the fact that it has so many ligaments associated with it. So I'll try to simplify it to some extent. So as we already know about anterior longitudinal ligament, which courses along the anterior part of the vertebral bodies, its extension above the vertebrae up to the skull base is in the form of anterior atlanto occipital membrane. Posterior longitudinal ligament which courses behind the vertebral bodies, its extension up to the skull base above the vertebrae is in the form of tectorial membrane. The ligamentum flavum which we already, which we commonly report in our degenerative spine is behind the spinal cord. Its course above the vertebrae, the above the spinous process up to the skull base in, is in the form of posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. So this completes three important ligaments that anterior atlanto-occipital membrane which is an extension of anterior longitudinal ligament, tectorial membrane which is an extension of posterior longitudinal ligament and posterior atlanto-occipital membrane which is an extension of ligamentum flavum. Three more important ligaments that we have to know about are apical ligament, alar ligament and cruciate ligament. So apical ligament is simple. Apical ligament connects the tip of the odontoid to the clivus. This is the apical ligament. Alar ligament. This, these are the alar ligaments. Alar ligaments connects the odontoid process to the occipital condyles. So these are the alar ligaments. Cruciate ligament is in the shape of cross. So this is a cruciate ligament. So hence it has a transverse part and a longitudinal part. The transverse part is commonly labeled in FRCR exams. So this uh, transverse part of the cruciate ligament is behind the odontoid process. This is the transverse part of the cruciate ligament. The longitudinal part of the cruciate ligament, uh, it has a superior band and an inferior band. The superior band is uh, attaching to the clivus. Uh, from the odontoid to the clivus, while the inferior band is uh, actually attaching to the C2 vertebral body. So this completes all the ligaments of CV junction. So now discussing some important measurements and lines to diagnose any case of CV junction anomaly. So starting with the most basic line uh, that is McRae's line or foramen magnum line which extends from basion to opisthion that is tip of the clivus to tip of the occipital bone DB. So that is uh, McRae's line and the tip of the dens uh, that is odontoid process should be below this line. In our case, it was above this line. Hence, what it was a case of basilar invagination. Uh, then uh, coming to another line that is McGregor's line, which extends from the posterior margin of the hard palate up to the lower part of the tip of the occipital bone. This A to C, AC, this line, the posterior margin of the hard palate to the lower border of the occipital bone. 
this is McGregor's line and the dense tip should not be more than 7 mm above this line. Chamberlain's line lies between these two lines that is uh, McRae's line as well as McGregor's line. Chamberlain's line extends from the posterior uh, uh, margin of the heart palate up to the tip of the occipital bone. AB. This AB is called uh, Chamberlain's line and the tip of the dent should not be more than 5 mm above this particular line. So this finishes our McRae's line that is foramen magnum line, McGregor's line and Chamberlain's line between these two. Then coming to uh, Wickenheim's line, Wickenheim's lines, uh, Wickenheim line is actually along the clivus. The line falls to uh, intersect the posterior one third of the odontoid. So this particular line is actually Wickenheim's line. And it is used in the assessment of CV junction traumatic injuries. Another important angle that is Welsher basal angle, which is actually this particular angle. The, the, it is angle formed between these two lines that is GF and FD. So we'll be discussing this later on in the video and it should typically be less than 140 degrees. So it's for assessment of platyglesia. So this is the line that I was talking about. Uh, the angle is formed by a line joining the nasion with the center of the pituitary fossa and a line joining the anterior border of the foramen magnum. Anterior border of the foramen magnum with the center of the pituitary fossa. And normally it is up 125 to 143. Platybasia is more than 143 degrees. So coming to my next case, here we have a 55 year old male who has a history of recurrent strokes and on MRI I saw uh, multiple encephalomalacia in bilateral capsuloganglionic regions resulting from chronic lacunar infarcts and hence I got a angiography done for this patient. So this is the intracranial angiography, the cervical segment of the internal carotid artery, petrous segment, cavernous segment of the internal carotid artery and these are the middle cerebral arteries, anterior cerebral arteries. So this is the angiography of the neck vessels where we can see the common carotid arteries, bifurcation of the common carotid arteries into external and the internal carotid arteries and these are the internal carotid arteries as we can see. So at the bifurcation which was not seen very well in the video, uh, I could see some plaques at the bifurcation extending into the internal carotid artery which were atherosclerotic plaques because of which the infarcts were uh, occurring. So this is the report that I had given that there was atherosclerotic plaque in bilateral internal carotid arteries causing luminal stenosis uh, which was described as a diameter stenosis. So I had calculated diameter stenosis in this particular image and I will show you how to do that later on in this video. And also I had mentioned the segment uh, as to how much length of the internal carotid artery was involved from its bifurcation which is also uh, important to be mentioned in any report and uh, it is very important to correlate it with the carotid dopplers to actually visualize the flow in the real time. So I'll take this case as an important opportunity to discuss all the important anatomy related to the vascular structures in the head and neck. So starting with the anterior cerebral artery. So I'll be discussing the important segments of the vessels as well as important branches. So starting with the anterior cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery has five important segments. Uh, the segments namely are A1 segment which is the pre-communicating segment that is before the anterior cerebral artery gives off ACOM that is anterior communicating artery. It's called the A1 segment of the anterior cerebral artery or pre-communicating segment of the anterior cerebral artery. A2 segment that is between the two cerebral hemispheres that we commonly see on the axial uh, sections are uh, after it gives off ACOM that is post communicating segment which is very commonly labeled in FRCR exams. Then comes the pre callosal segment after the anterior cerebral artery gives off the calloso marginal uh, branch. The calloso marginal branch is given off and after that uh, in the anterior part of the corpus callosum, uh, this particular segment of the anterior cerebral artery that is A3 segment is uh, called pre-callosal segment of the anterior cerebral artery. 
Then comes the supra carousel segment of the anterior cerebral artery or A4 segment of the anterior cerebral artery that lies above the corpus callosum on the sagittal images. A3, A4, A5 are all seen on sagittal images. A5 segment is post callosal segment that is after uh, it crosses the corpus callosum. It is the post callosal segment of the anterior cerebral artery. So the important branches are ACOM that is anterior communicating artery, callosomarginal artery as well as recurrent artery of Hubner. So recurrent artery of Hubner also called medial striate artery or long central artery is the largest perforating branch of the proximal anterior cerebral artery and is one of the arteries that is routinely seen on angiography and it actually originates uh, from the anterior cerebral artery at A1, A2 junction. A1, A2 junction. Uh, that is a uh, level of the anterior communicating artery only it uh, arises recurrent artery of humor or within few millimeters of the proximal A2 segment of 90 uh, uh, within few millimeters of proximal A2 segment in 90 percent of the cases this uh, recurrent artery it actually supplies the caudate head so it's an important vessel anterior cerebral arteries recurrent artery of humor so coming to the important segments and branches of the middle cerebral artery now so middle cerebral artery has four important segments starting with the first segment that is m1 segment which is also called horizontal segment which lies within the sylvian fissure it is relatively horizontal and hence called horizontal segment and it, from it arises multiple lenticulostriate arteries it supply the capsuloganglionic region and responsible for lacunar infarcts so this is the horizontal segment or m1 segment then it divides into superior and inferior trunk. The uh, M2 segment is uh, also called insular segment, which is lie, lies in the insular cortex. Now you can see this M2 segment and M3 segment, opercular segment, the upper trunk. And M4 segment lies in superficial to the cortex in the parietal and the temporal regions, as we see. So M1 segment, M2 segment, M3 segment, and M4 segment. These are the segments of the middle cerebral artery which are commonly seen on angiography. Now coming to the posterior cerebral artery, which has five important segments. P1 segment is before uh, the PCOM, that is uh, PCOM arising from the ICA, joins the posterior cerebral artery. Now before it's joining is P1 or pre-communicating segment of the posterior cerebral artery. P2 is again subdivided into A and B. P2A lies anterior to the cerebral peduncles of the midbrain in the crural cistern. P2B lies in the ambient cistern. So this is the P2 segment. P3 segment lies in the quadrigeminal cistern. P4 segment also called the cortical segment lies in the occipital lobe sulci. And P5 are the terminal branches of the posterior cerebral artery which are calcarine artery and the parieto occipital arteries calcarine artery and parieto occipital arteries this is all important it has been asked multiple times in FRCR exams so uh, terminal branches of uh, the posterior cerebral arteries are calcarine artery and parieto occipital arteries which are actually the p5 segments the important uh, one of the important branches of uh, posterior cerebral artery are the choroidal branches which arise from the P2 segment. This long P2 segment gives rise to two important branches that is medial posterior choroidal arteries and lateral posterior choroidal arteries which supply the choroid plexus of the ventricle. Now, now coming to vertebral artery and its important four segments that is preforaminal segment, foraminal segment, extradural segment and intradural or intracranial segment v1 v2 v3 and v4 so v1 segment or preforaminal segment are, is actually from the origin uh, from its origin uh, from the subclavian artery up to the transverse process of c6 vertebra is v1 segment or preforaminal segment foraminal segment is within the transverse process within the foramen of transverse process from c6 vertebra to c2 vertebra this is V2 segment or foraminal segment. Then from C2, where the artery uh, from C2 it starts, uh, the V3 segment starts from C2, where the artery loops and turns lateral to ascend into the transverse foramen and continues through C1 to pierce the dura. So this is actually the V3 segment. 
and after that is the V4 segment that is intracranial portion of the vertebral artery which actually uh, joins on both sides to form the basilar artery. So now discussing the segments of the internal carotid artery now. So internal carotid artery has total of seven important segments that we have to remember starting with the cervical segment within the neck that we saw the petrous segment along the petrous part the temporal bone that is a c2 segment c3 segment when it courses along the foramen lacerum c4 uh, and the adjacent to the cavernous sinus is a c4 segment c5 segment clinoid segment c6 segment is the ophthalmic segment from which the ophthalmic artery the largest branch rises then comes the communicating segment or c7 segment which actually bifurcates into the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery so uh, what we have to remember are some of the important branches arising from these segments. So the important branches arise from C2, C4 and C6 segment as well as C7 segment. So we can remember it's even the number uh, where two, two branches arise. That is carotico-tympanic artery, median artery from C2 or petrous segment, inferior hypophyseal artery and meningeal artery from cavernous segment, ophthalmic artery from the ophthalmic segment along with the superior hypophyseal artery, and the communicating artery gives rise to anterior choroidal artery and you know, posterior communicating arteries. So these are the this is the diagrammatic depiction of some of the segments: cervical uh, segment, petrous segment, cavernous segment, so on. Some of the important branches: artery of uh, pterygoid canal, also called the median artery. Now, how to calculate the diameter stenosis? So, diameter stenosis, uh, the important formula that is used uh, according to the North American Symptomatic Carotid End Arteritomy Trial, that is NASIT trial, is a percentage ICA stenosis is 1 minus the narrowest ICA diameter because of the plaque divided by diameter of the normal distal cervical ICA in 200. So this is the way to calculate the diameter stenosis, and based on this, actually. Uh, uh, we are uh, the patient is managed with end arterectomy. So NASIT trial demonstrates a conclusive benefit for uh, carotid end arterectomy in patients with symptomatic 70 to 99 percent of ICA stenosis. So coming to my next case uh, where uh, there is a 45 year old female who complains of pain abdomen. Uh, she actually came for an ultrasound of the abdomen where I saw that the left kidney was hydronephrotic. But I could not see any echogenic calculus uh, within the left kidney. Uh, there was no dilatation of the ureter also as such. Uh, on X-ray QB, there was no calculus that was seen. And hence, I advised a CT urography for this patient. And these are the axial sections of the CT urography of this patient. The plain non-contrast where we can see a large cystic lesion, in the lower pole of the left kidney that is seen. Large cystic lesion the lower pole non-contrast CP. Of course, there are a uh, few fibroids within the uterus with calcific degeneration. And uh, CT, as it's a CT urography, these are the post-contrast images. The nephrogenic phase, where we can see that there is a large cystic lesion in the lower pole, which was actually appearing hydronephrotic, but this is not communicating with the pelvic calcis system of the left kidney. It's actually a cystic lesion in the lower pole of the left kidney. On the delayed phases, where the pelvic calcis system is opacified, we can actually delineate the cystic lesion uh, very well, separate from the pelvic calcis system. A few enhancing separations large cystic lesion in the lower pole. So this is the report I had given a well-defined hypodense cystic lesion in the lower pole of left kidney uh, which has a thin wall and shows multiple thin enhancing septations which was suggestive of a complex cyst with Bosniak category of 2F. So uh, I'll take this opportunity to discuss the, uh, the latest Bosniak classification that is Bosniak 2019 of CT. So this is the Bosniak 2019 classification where all the categories 1, 2, 2F, 3 and 4 are very well described. So I'll just discuss the 2F category now. 
so where the cystic masses with smooth minimally thickened enhancing wall or smooth minimally thickened of one or more enhancing septa or multiple more than equal to four septa which are thin less than 2 mm uh, and enhancing so this was our case and hence it was a 2f of bosniac and read the rest uh, of the bosniac categories as well so it's an important update 2019 so coming to my next case a 55 year old male with severe backache these are the t1 and these are the t2 weighted sagittal images of the uh, lumbosacral spine and uh, other than the degenerative discs, there is something very important that is seen within these images. It's actually a spotter case. So the important thing is to see for this particular hyperintensity between the spinous processes uh, of the vertebrae. And it is because of the interspinous bursitis, also called vastrope disease. So it's a very important cause of the pain in the uh, back and has to be reported so bastrop disease or a syndrome is actually a cause of low back pain which is characterized by interspinous bursitis and other degenerative changes of the bones and the soft tissue where adjacent spinous process in the lumbar spine rub against each other so this process can result in degenerative hypertrophy inflammatory change uh, and even a uh, pseudo arthrosis with bursa formation the interspinous bursa may extend between the ligamentum flava in the midline forming an epidural cyst and further contributing to an uh, exiting canal stenosis and this condition is usually seen in patients with excessive lumbar lordosis so this is my next case where a 18 months old child presented with seizures and delayed milestones and this is the mri of this patient uh, these are the coronal T1 weighted images, these are the T2 weighted images, flare images and DWI images. So a striking thing that is seen on the T2 and the flare images are the hyperintensity in the white matter, confluent hyperintensity within the white matter in the frontal and the parietal regions that are seen and also in the splenium. So it is very well seen and it is sparing the subcortical U fibers even on T1 weighted images, it, it is appearing hypo intense. There is no restriction as such that was seen. So this is a report I had given. Uh, extensive T2 signal seen in the periventricular white matter extending to the subcalosal white matter, sparing the subcortical U fibers associated with volume loss, frontal lobe predominance, although parietal and the temporal periventricular white matter were also involved. The changes were confluent involving the splenium. Uh, of the corpus callosum there was no restriction that was seen or any blooming on susceptibility to images so it was actually a case of metachromatic leukodystrophy which is actually the most common hereditary leukodystrophy uh, and is one of the lysosomal storage disorders so it is very important to know all the leukodystrophies in pediatric age group but uh, this is the most common one and hence you should uh, definitely know this by heart as it presents as tigroid pattern on fluid sensitive MRI sequences because of the perivenular sparing, which is actually also a spotter. So the important thing is that I would like to take the opportunity to discuss this very important uh, thing here, which is very commonly asked in the VIVA questions as uh, the progression of the myelination in uh, children or in units so the progression of myelination is predictable and a uh, few simple rules are it is central to peripheral caudal to cranial dorsal to ventral and sensory and then motor and the important milestones that we have to remember this is actually a chart which i have in my reporting room in front of me uh, to that so that i remember uh, that this is a case of delayed myelination or abnormal myelination in any child so at term term uh, the important structures that are myelinated uh, are are the dorsal brainstem the partial posterior limb of the internal capsule the perirolandic gyri and the lateral thalami so these are the important structures that are myelinated at birth in a term infant 
then all the milestones uh, that we have to remember at three to four months the posterior limb of internal capsule at six months the ventral brain stem the anterior limb of the internal capsule 12 months the most of the corona radiata 18 months all the white matter except temporal and the uh, frontal u fibers and at 24 months that is two years anterior temporal and frontal u fibers are uh, myelinated so by the time the child reaches two years he should have complete myelination and uh, these are the terminal zones that is the anterior temporal and the anterior frontal region which are myelinated last and also posterior to the lateral ventricles those areas are also myelinated in the end they may uh, also not be myelinated after two years so you have to remember uh, these things that how a normal brain in pediatric age group looks like to identify any pathology in pediatric age group so coming to my next case where a 35 year old male with left sided hearing loss tinnitus and diplopia came for an hrct of the temporal bone so uh, this is the clinician ordered an hrct where i saw a lytic destruction of the petrous part of the temporal bone and some soft tissue uh, density within the middle ear so actually uh, he uh, has a recurrent history of csom and also fever and hence the clinician ordered a hrct of the temporal bone to look at the ossicles but uh, this was what i saw there was a lytic destruction and soft tissue density and hence i got an mri done for this patient so this is the mri picture uh, these are the t1 post contrast images so on the t1 post contrast images what we can clearly see is a peripherally enhancing collection uh, within the petrous part of the temporal bone and uh, I got a cis image done or PS tire sequence where um, it was clear why he was having a uh, diplopia that is because this particular collection this uh, in the petrous part of the temporal bone was actually uh, in involving the sixth nerve which is traversing through the Dorelos canal uh, in this particular region the prepontine system and uh, because of this particular re uh, reason he was having diplopia. So this is actually a case of petrous epicytis, also called Gradenigo syndrome. So Gradenigo syndrome uh, is, consists of a typical triad of uh, suppurative otitis media, abducens nerve palsy, secondary to the involvement of the nerve as it passes through the Dorelos canal, and retroorbital pain, uh, which uh, is because of the trigeminal nerve involvement, which is in the Meckel's cave, which is also around that particular area. So additionally, the patient tend to suffer intractable otoria and pain in the region of the ophthalmic and the maxillary branches of the trigeminal nerve as well. Uh, the syndrome typically arises as a consequence of CSOM uh, spreading to the petrous apex of the temporal bone, resulting in petrous epicytis and the trigeminal ganglia in the abducens nerve like close proximity to the petrous apex within the Meckel's cave and the Dorelos canal respectively. And the extradural inflammation due to the petrous epicytis may uh, therefore affect these nearby structures and hence giving rise to this particular uh, triad of symptoms called Gradenigo syndrome. So uh, this is the anatomy uh, describing the Dorelos canal and the Meckel's cave. So Dorelos canal uh, channels the abducens nerve. As we can see, this is the abducens nerve and uh, the Dorelos canal has some boundaries superiorly it is bounded by the gruber's ligament inferiorly uh, by the sphenoid bone medially the dorsum cellae and laterally by the petrous apex and hence when the uh, case of infection of the petrous apex it is commonly involved Meckel's cave also known as trigeminal cave or trigeminal cavity or Meckel cavity is a csf containing dual pouch in the middle cranial fossa uh, that is uh, this is the Meckel's cave. This is the cavernous sinus and this is the Meckel's cave and it ha it houses the trigeminal ganglion and uh, it's also uh, very commonly involved in case of petrous epicytis as you can see it's in close proximity to the petrous part of the temporal wound. So coming to my next case which is actually a case of ischemic stroke. So uh, I'm discussing this case just to discuss the stroke protocol with you. So he's a 55 year old male who came with acute onset uh, right sided hemiplegia. And we can see that there's some hypodensity in the MCA territory in the left side. As we can see. 
the on the left side the mc territory is involved this is the angiography done for this patient and these are the cervical segments of the internal carotid arteries as we see and we'll scroll up from here now we can see the petrous portion of the internal carotid artery bilaterally the cavernous portion and we can see in the right side the m uh, m2 m3 segments are very well visualized but here on the left side the m2 m3 segments are not visualized only the cortical segment of the middle cerebral artery is visualized so uh, what exactly is mca aspects that is alberta stroke program early ct score this should be given in all cases of acute uh, ischemic strokes uh, involving the middle cerebral artery for that we have to remember the m1 m the important components of aspects which include m1 m2 m3 m4 m5 m6 segments so m1 m2 m3 segments lie at the level of basal ganglia and m4 m5 m6 segments lie above it the uh, caudate nucleus the internal capsule the lentiform nucleus and the insular cortex are other components of the aspects that we uh, need to remember so coming to mca aspects segmental estimation of the middle cerebral artery vascular territory is made and one point it is reduced from the initial score of 10 for every region that is involved caudate nucleus lutamen internal capsule insular cortex m1 segment or anterior mca cortex m2 mca cortex lateral to the insular ribbon m3 the posterior mca cortex m4 is above m1 m5 is superior to m2 and m6 is superior to m3 as i already shown you in the diagram the important points to be remembered are m1 to m3 are at the level of basal ganglia and m4 to m6 are the level of ventricles immediately above the basal ganglia now coming to the main reason why angiography is done in even in cases of acute settings is to assess large vessel occlusion so large vessel occlusion also called proximal large vessel occlusion describes the occlusion of the proximal and large size intracranial arteries uh, resulting in impending acute ischemic strokes so a consensus was uh, that the large vessel is more than 2 mm and thus keeping in uh, this particular definition the occlusion of following arteries are generally included in the definition of large vessel occlusion intracranial internal carotid arteries m1 segment also m2 segment of the middle cerebral artery the basal artery the intracranial vertebral arteries and a1 a2 segments of the anterior cerebral arteries so this is the stroke protocol that we uh, need to remember in case of uh, any ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke first an ncct is done to rule out hemorrhage if there is hemorrhage standard therapy with mannitol and conservative treatment or craniotomy is done if there is no hemorrhage then the onset of the stroke is to be looked out if it is less than or equal to 4.5 hours that is window period for iv thrombolysis a ct angiography should be done to rule out large vessel occlusion if there is large vessel occlusion and the ct aspect is more than equal to 6 we go for a mechanical thrombectomy along with uh, iv rtpa or uh, iv uh, thrombolytics if there is no large vessel occlusion which is seen on uh, angiography we only give uh, iv uh, thrombolytics and we don't go for a mechanical thrombectomy also uh, if the large vessel occlusion is present but the ct aspect is less than 6 we go for only iv thrombolytic therapy and no mechanical thrombectomy so that is the importance of ct aspects as uh, radiologists and large vessel occlusions because it is a very important uh, criteria for management of a stroke patient so when the onset is between 4.5 to 6 hours again a ct angiography is performed and if there is a large vessel occlusion with ct aspects of more than equal to 6 mechanical thrombectomy with iv rtpa is given unless contraindicated and if there is no large vessel occlusion or aspects is less than 6 best medical treatment is given 6 to 24 hours uh, on cta uh, if there is a large vessel occlusion and the ct aspects is more than equal to 6 we go for a ct perfusion or a diffusion perfusion 
protocol to look for penumbra so here is where the difference is that after six hours even if there is a large vessel occlusion on ct angiography and the ct aspects is more than equal to six we still go for a perfusion imaging to look for penumbra if there is no large vessel occlusion or the ct aspects is less than six we go for the best medical management so this is the entire stroke protocol that has to be remembered by everyone who is actually reporting cases of ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. So when exactly can we do mechanical thrombectomy? So patients should receive mechanical thrombectomy with a stent retriever if the age of the patient is more than equal to 18 years. NIHS score which is calculated clinically is more than equal to 6, aspects is more than equal to 6 and uh, there is causative occlusion of ICA, M1, MCA that is the large vessels and treatment should be initiated within 6 hours of the symptom onset. So coming to my next case which is actually a patient who presented with severe headache and we got a venography done for this patient, MR venography. But uh, this is a normal uh, venography, but I wanted to discuss the anatomy with you. And uh, these are the coronal sections of the MR venography where we can see that superior sagittal sinus, the transverse sinus uh, that is seen, the sigmoid sinus and the internal jugular vein. So these are the coronal sections uh, where we see all this, uh, the inferior sagittal sinus is also seen. But, but it is always important to look at the 3D images, that is the sagittal images as well where we can uh, particularly see the inferior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, the internal cerebral veins and the vein of Callan. So it is very very important to know uh, whether all the veins and even the uh, superficial and the middle cerebral veins uh, can be seen and assessed. In this particular case, if you uh, look at the uh, transverse sagittal images as well. And this is the diagrammatic depiction of the anatomy uh, where we can see the superior sagittal sinus, the transverse sinus, <coughs> the straight sinus all meeting at the confluence of the sinuses. Also here one occipital sinus is there. Then the inferior sagittal sinus, the internal cerebral veins on both sides joined to form the vein of Gallen, uh, vein of Trollard and Labe. Uh, Vein of Trollard connects, uh, that is drains the superficial middle cerebral vein into the superior sagittal sinus and vein of Trollard connects the superficial middle cerebral vein to the transverse sinus. This is the inferior petrosal sinus which joins the sigmoid sinus to form the jugular vein. Coming to uh, cerebral venous drainage which actually has three superficial veins and three deep veins. The superficial veins include the superior cerebral vein, the middle cerebral vein and the inferior cerebral vein. The middle cerebral vein is again has uh, superficial and deep uh, cerebral, middle cerebral veins. The superficial part is connected to the superior cerebral sinus by the vein of Trollard while it is connected to the transverse sinus by the vein of Labe. Then coming to the deep veins, the deep veins include the internal cerebral veins, the great cerebral vein of Gallen and the basal vein. The internal cerebral vein is actually formed by the thalamostriate vein and the choroidal vein. Great cerebral vein of Gallen is formed by the union of two internal cerebral vein and the basal vein of Rosenthal is actually formed the anterior cerebral vein and the deep middle cerebral vein. The superior sagittal sinus, uh, the superior cerebral vein drains into the superior sagittal sinus, the inferior cerebral vein drains into the transverse sinus and the cavernous sinus, while the superficial middle cerebral vein drains into the cavernous sinus, though it is connected to the superior sagittal sinus by the vein of Trollard and the inferior sagittal sinus to the vein of Labe. So coming to my next case, so this is an ultrasound case where this patient came for scar assessment uh, in the third trimester that is just uh, 35 to 36 weeks of gestation she came for scar assessment and this was actually the picture that was seen ballooning of the scar that was seen which was suggestive of uterine day since she came with acute pain so how exactly uh, the scar thickness should be measured in this gestational age so uh, the important anatomical landmarks are to be remembered that is the urinary bladder the fetal head 
and the scar thickness can either be assessed as a lower uterine scar segment thickness or as a myometrial thickness so where you lower uterine segment scar thickness is assessed we actually combine the myometrium and the bladder mucosa and the cutoff is 2.5 mm if it is less than 2.5 mm it is considered to be a thinned out scar and if only myometrial thickness is actually given then a cutoff of 2 mm is considered that is if it is less than 2 mm it is uh, considered a thin scar prone to dehiscence so lower segment scar thickness and myometrial thickness are the two important things uh, that are assessed in scar thickness and other than that the scar shape should be triangular in normally if it has ballooning or collection it is indicative of dehiscence or rupture scar continuity has to be man maintained and the eco texture of the scar uh, is supposed to be homogeneous 